How you doing? I'm Bill Geisley from Geisley Automatics. Uh, today I'm here to show you a new company that we started, Abraham and Moses Survival Equipment. Now there's several companies under the Geisley umbrella. Geisley Automatics, which is well known for its combat and national match triggers and rails. There's ALG Defense, that's my wife's company. Her deal is the square deal. You get great value with great products from ALG Defense. We also have NCC, Nano Composite Coatings. This is a company that's going to be putting on Nano Weapon. This is the new Picatinny DSL type coating for gun parts. And we also have Abraham and Moses Survival Equipment. Two years ago, my eight-year-old son Abraham asked me if we could make a knife. And I said, Abraham, why don't we start a company together and you can learn how to make knives and I can learn how to make knives and we'll, learn, we'll do business together and we'll teach you how to take care of customers and what it's like to do business. So we started Abraham and Moses. And when I was at one of my military customers, I mentioned to them about this knife company. And they said, you gotta talk to Lou Goodman. Now Lou has been in the US military for 23 years. And he was a program manager, all right? He's a special operations soldier, but he's a program manager in heavy weapons, 50 cal, uh, big automatic weapons, but he is also a master knife maker. And, I, and, and Lou and I got together, and this is Lou Goodman right here, and he was gracious enough to give me all kinds of advice on how to make a knife. But what's more, we formed a partnership to make a knife to Lou's specification that he would be proud for his old organization, for those guys who are kicking doors in every day to use a knife for the special operator. And this knife we call the Goodman Special Operations Combat Knife. And Lou, you've been in the military for how long? 23 years. Recently yes. retired, right? Uh, just last April. Correct. Exactly. How long have you been making knives? Uh, almost 10 years now. Yeah. Okay. Hand forge, uh, uh, a little bit of stock removal, but uh, almost 10 years. Okay. Lou's been making knives for 10 years. Now, Lou, you carried a knife in combat, didn't you? I most certainly did. And yeah, who, would who, not go without it. Who, who made that knife? Uh, a friend of mine that I worked with, uh, Bob Horgan, made that knife for me. Yeah, okay. I carried almost on every. And it's a very special knife for you, isn't it? Sure is. Sure exactly. Is. So, Lou, this knife right here that you designed, if you could tell us a little bit about the design features of it. For instance, sure. how come it's that long? Okay, well, if you wouldn't mind holding this sure. for me there. So uh, uh, we started out with this knife. Um, I was inspired by my friend Bob, uh, who you know, taught me, first got me into knife making. And uh, um, this blade is approximately six inches long. So you want a blade in combat that is, uh, you know, four inches is too short, seven inches is too long. I've carried the Randall knives that are seven, eight inches. Um, so when you're mounting stuff on your kit, if you wouldn't mind giving me one of the sheets sure. to um, you can see as the knife matches up, you don't want something that's going to hang down below your waist when you're wearing it on your side, on your belt, your strong side or your weak side. You don't want something that when you sit down on the aircraft, it's going to continually punch into your leg. So we designed this sheath and this knife to be approximately six inches long from the uh, ricasso here all the way to the tip. For me and all those actions that I was in, uh, riding around in uh, mobility operations, pickup trucks, armored vehicles, uh, every aircraft known to man, this is the optimal length for this knife. Now how about the hilt here? I notice this has a hilt. It's not a huge hilt, right. but it's, it's very nicely shaped. Tell me why you need a hilt. So the biggest thing is, a lot of knives you see out there in the guard area here, the guard is very, very short. So if I was to t take this knife and I stabbed into something hard, whether I thought it was a soft surface at the beginning or what, something hard is always going to be behind it. Um, my hand could come over that knife and cut, uh, cut myself on the sharp edge of the knife. So I will never make a knife that doesn't have a full-size guard for combat use. So as you see, it covers my finger totally. So if I ever had to stab with that knife, even if it was a reverse grip, I have no doubt, uh, in conjunction with the design of the handle, the way it's contoured and rounded and uh, the double palm swells, that this knife is going to come out of my hand. I have full control of the knife. Now I notice it doesn't have a skull breaker on the end, and I remember you specifically did not want that right. because if it's mounted to your kit here, yes. you could get caught with it on your on your chin, couldn't you? That's correct. So what Bill's describing there is um, a lot of knives you see have a sharpened edge here or another tool on it, uh, something to do something else with, screwdrivers, whatnot. I've seen that before. 
but the way we used to wear our kit, so I'd mount this high on my, my armor, and uh, if you notice, if you sit down, this is gonna get closer to my face as my vest was to push up. If I was ever in any rough terrain, my face could hit that. So I have a rounded end that's exposed on here, and what that's for is uh, law enforcement, military applications. You could take that rounded end where the steel's exposed, hit the corner of a window, shatter the window. Uh, when you need to get in and out of vehicles, either extract someone or you need to get out of the vehicle. So that was the purpose for that. Yep. yep. Now, I know when you talked about the design parameters, this one of the main design parameters was the knife has to be able to be used as a prying tool. Sure. And that's different from right. a lot of knives out there that are only for skinning or only for cutting. Yes. And you talk to a lot of knife makers and, and they say, hey, a knife is for cutting. You want a prying tool, get a crowbar. Yes. But in your profession, sometimes you just have to pry with a knife, right? That's correct. And so what Bill's describing there is, and we've talked about it many times, uh, a knife like this is a cutting tool primarily, but in extremist times, I've got to be able to pry with this. So uh, I've pried everything overseas as you can think of. I've pried locks off of stuff. I've pried into uh, cabinets. I've pried the uh, floor pans off of vehicles to search for uh, uh, explosives. Uh, I've pried the uh, glove, glove compartment boxes. Glove compartment uh, boxes open. Uh, anything you could think to pry with, I've probably pried, pried with my uh, my custom knives and uh, the knives that were made me, uh, for me by my friend Bob. Um, so when I learned to hand forge, um, I went to a guy in Wyoming named Ed Fowler, and he taught me the principles of uh, differential hardening. So what that is, that allows this cutting tool to be able to pry in an extremist time when you need it. So the cutting edge would be hardened to say uh, 59 Rockwell, where the spine in the center would stay at a lower Rockwell hardness, as this is uh, 33. So it allows the knife, uh, if you were to pry, it, it would. You can't put enough human force with it on your hand to actually bend the knife. To test that, uh, once we get the knife down to uh, uh, those parameters, we gin up the knife in a, uh, a vise before the handles are put on it. And you can't pry it with your with your hand, hand and bend it, right? No. Nope. So we'll gin it up in a vise to about right here, two wooden blocks, and then we'll put a pry bar over it. And and how we'll, long is that pry bar? Uh, it needs to be between uh, two and a half to three feet. Exactly. Yeah, the human hand cannot bend it. And we'll bend that knife to 90 degrees flat, as you see here. There you go. Now, so, Lou was talking about differential hardening, and I don't know if you can see it. You might not be able to see it in the light. I'll move it around. See that shadow right here? A, a little, from, from a quarter inch to three-eighths of an inch of that area of the knife is hardened to approximately 59 to 62 Rockwell, where the Correct. rest of it is about 32 Rockwell, which is very strong, but ductile. And that allows this knife to do that. If you had a cutting tool that was running at 5960 Rockwell and you tried to bend it, it will break. Not this guy right here. Correct. This is an extreme duty knife. Correct. High endurance. High endurance. endurance. That's I right. I used the wrong terminology. Yeah, I'm sorry that's about right. that. High endurance. Exactly. Yep. Now, Lou, you know, I noticed that when you when you when you have knives out there, I've I've always been disappointed in the sheath. So, same, same here. Same, same there. So, so you know, guys, our, my engineering department, we work to build the sheath that Lou would be proud of to use on his knife. So what we did is we manufactured a sheath entirely out of 7075 T6 aluminum. It's a machine sheath. Here's the two pound block of aluminum. And here's the cover plate right here. That's what we machine. 1.8 ounces, two pounds down to 1.8 ounces. You can see all the beautiful machining marks in here and the beautiful geometry. This is a true jewel of a manufactured part. Very difficult, not only to design, but also to make. And the sheath that we have, and Lou, if you want to demonstrate it. Sure, we would glad to. So I'll use the, uh, the locking one yep. first. So a couple good uh, features on this sheath. Um, First and foremost, it has a molly attachment that comes on it. It can be mounted on your vest. It can be mounted on all the modern packs that are out there. Every backpack that's out there has a molly attachment. And all your assault vests, whether you're military or law enforcement, has a molly attachment. Also offered, me and Bill were talking, I said, you gotta have a way to put this on your belt also. So you get an adjustable belt uh, that's uh, machined also, and you decide which size you use on that. That comes with the kit. Okay, so one of the greatest things I think about this sheath is, um, and, uh, uh, and Bill had a great idea, you know, we were talking, how are we going to keep this in the sheath? So there's a divot on the knife. 
if you see it's reversible it's on either side so that makes this a truly ambidextrous sheath and knife because you also have the dual palm swells in the handle so that's for a right-handed or left-handed user so once it goes in the sheath it's a positive lock that is not coming out the harder you pull the tighter the, hard, it gets. the tighter it gets so another great feature on the way out as a natural draw stroke just like a pistol you hit the button it comes out you can flip the knife over for a left-handed person and you got a left-handed uh, draw there or you are military law enforcement or you're out in the outdoors you're tangled up in something you're in you're riding horses you get in a horse pack train wreck like i've been in before they're scattering everywhere you got to get your knife cut some rope free you can put the knife back in the sheath any way you choose to and it's going to lock up and be in there yep yep now if you don't want the lock let's say you don't sure. want the lock and that's just not your preference so there's some other reasons why you wouldn't want to lock um, so you push the pin out on this it comes in the kit and you put the other button in and you get a, a, a true friction so you get two buttons with this knife kit you get two backing plates molly and you also get the the, the uh the belt holder, okay, but you also get two buttons. One's the lock and one's the friction. So for the friction, there is a nylon liner that is um, uh, 3D printed that is down inside here. So you can see this, the knife starts to take friction about right there and then it's in there. Okay, so it's not gonna come out unless I want it to come out. It doesn't take a lot to pull it. You know, the user needs to be smart. Don't mount it upside down in the cool guy method and then go trudging through the jungle for a day and not think that eventually a vine's gonna get a hold of it. And it's gonna fall out eventually. Be smart, use the locking button. The locking button is, is great for military operations, skydiving, subsurface diving, riding around your horses on your side by sides, four wheeling. You just need to be smart if you're gonna use the friction adapter. So the benefit of that is you can mount it on any of your kit, but I can reverse draw it at any time without looking at it. I don't have to take my pinky and try to pinky draw, which isn't gonna work. Another great thing is, knives are used in the winter all the time, right? Of course. So if you're out hunting, you're an outdoorsman, what are you gonna have on? You're not gonna be walking around uh, with no gloves on. So this friction adapter carried on a strong side or a weak side, because I'm a right-handed guy, um, is great because when I'm in heavy gloves, I can reach down and draw the knife from any position. Yep. With either hand, I don't have to find the button. Whether it's on my vest, I can reach down and draw it. So, now the, the great feature. Now the question that a lot of guys are going to ask: What steel is the knife made out of? Lou, you want great. to? So uh, um, Bill knows from uh, the, you know our past conversations. I was forging at 52100. He said, "Let's find a comparable steel, and, and maybe we'll look around and find something even better that can fit the uh, uh, the modern applications. You know, going into production." versus trying to hand forge everything like I do, you know, which would take hundreds of hours. So uh, Bill showed me this steel from uh, Pennsylvania, which is Carpenter PD-1. Great steel. Uh, they've been in business how long, Bill? 100 127 years. years. Yep. So great steel, locally sourced out of Pennsylvania, and uh, um, it has took this differential hardening treatment and the temperings just as good as any steel that I've ever worked. PD-1 stands for punch die one. Carpenter Steel makes specialty steels. They don't make angle iron and high beams and commodity steel. They do high strength stainlesses, alloys for aircraft landing gear on aircraft carriers, your hip implants, things like that for medical devices. This is the kind of steel Carpenter makes. PD-1 has unique characteristics. At 60 Rockwell, which is the brittle transition zone, where if you load something at 60 Rockwell, it'll just snap without the forming. PD-1 has some ductility at that. And with the differential hardening that Lou specified on this, and the triple tempering for the first heat treatment, and then triple tempering after the final heat treatment for six tempers, this knife is, with this steel, is the ultimate knife that I believe of the future, along with the, with the sheath of the future. And Lou, it's great to be in partnership with you. You have tremendous knowledge about this, and it's, it's, uh, you couldn't find somebody with the knowledge that you have. And uh, it's great to be in partnership with you. And, and just, check, just check out the website, guys. It's, it's live. It's, it's brand new. It's, it's abenmo.com. Okay, abenmo. In case you're wondering, Abraham and Moses, that's my, my boys. Abraham's 10. Moses is three years old. All right, so it's named after my boys. But the, the Lou Goodman Special Operations Combat Knife, it's the knife of the future.
Thanks, Lou. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Appreciate it. Thank you for watching.